Ron is nope. connecting hey, to audio. Hey, hey, dot, hey, dot, hey, dot, hey. dot 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 dot. This is the longest. Yes, Ron, I think you have us. I think I finally got it. I think you did it, man. Yes. Oh, okay. We are live on Facebook. Uh, first, I want to say apologies to the Facebook audience that we're 15 minutes late. We had to work through some technical issues. Uh, there was a very catastrophic event. Uh, Robert Atkins, his neighbor, <laughs> found out that he was pirating his Wi-Fi, and so Robert is not going to be with us tonight. But we do have Ron Rudat. The If you guys don't know Ron yet, uh, we are so excited to have him. He is, I would say this, and I love all the creators that contributed to G.I. Joe, A Real American Hero, but if you look at it just from a volume perspective, how many things did one person make was like solely responsible for everything's a team effort but primarily responsible for ron designed for the first i believe it's around 125 figures everything from 1982 to 1986 plus some of the ones from 1987 but ron rudat designed a ton of figures also some of the best vehicles the fang the snake the thunder machine my favorite vehicle and he also did logos icons all this stuff is available on uh, 3djoes.com Ron and I sat for hours and recorded audio interviews, and that's all whittled down on that one page. So I'm not going to talk too much tonight. Uh, I want Brandon and Tom to get to have that experience that I had with Ron several years ago. So uh, guys, please take it from here. Okay. Uh, welcome to G.I. Joe Debriefed. My name is Brandon Jerwa. I, of course, wrote some G.I. Joe comics. My good friend Tom Feaster here has drawn some G.I. Joe comics, uh, and uh, that's very exciting, but we are very excited uh, once again to welcome another amazing G.I. Joe guest who uh, really played an incredibly significant part in our childhoods. Uh, and we are we are two in a row. We had we had uh, we had the great Larry Houston last night. We're very, very lucky to have Ron Rudad here. And uh, we're also going to do part five of the mass device. But uh, Tom, if you would, please praise our guest. Say wonderful things about him. <laughs> tell him why we all love him. He he knows, but tell him anyway. Um, <laughs> to to uh, to the, to borrow a phrase from Steve Barton, uh, the hour figures up with one hand. Um, I I I spent countless hours uh, playing with my GI Joe figures. Um, I think I owned everything that you designed. Uh, and I managed to take decent enough care of them. I never shot one with a BB gun, I promise you. Uh, I was never one of those M80 kids. Uh, so I, I, I lovingly adored every one of my G.I. Joe figures, and uh, your imagination created a world that I got to play in for uh, a long, long time, and then eventually professionally. So uh, as I said to Mr. Houston last night, thank you for my life. Ron, I told you they were going to shower you with platitudes. There will be some gushing this evening. Some gushing. Yeah. So, Ron, do you want to take a second and introdu introduce yourself to the audience that might not know you? I started at uh, uh, Hasbro in 1971 uh, working on uh, a lot of different projects for Hasbro. Uh, worked in the art department for about seven years, and then from that, um they asked me to come over to research and development and mm -hmm. those are the people basically who uh who designed all the product to all the toys and i i got to go over there and uh started out doing a lot of arts and crafts stuff and uh all kinds of different projects and um i forgot when it was in 1979 something like that or 1980 we had a presentation, and uh, I wanted to bring back G.I. Joe. So I, I presented a Tonka truck that I had uh, painted all of drab and uh, had put G.I. Joe stickers on it and brought it into a presentation. And uh, I don't think it went over that well at first. And uh, But it sparked something in Bob Prupitz who is the uh, senior uh, uh, marketing person at that time for Boys Toys. And he had been thinking about it also. And uh, what we pushed for it, we uh, 
cobbled up a bunch of figures uh, from various different figure lines and made some military type figures. And, and uh, that was all presented to Stephen Hasenfeld. And uh, I guess it was a big major presentation. I can't remember it exactly, but uh, Steve DeGuano went in there with a campaign hat and a swagger stick and he slammed it on a table and he yelled and screamed about uh, the, the military, you know, bringing up Joe back and how great it would be and everything to Steve and Hasenfeld. And he said, um, yeah, well, you know, it, it looks good. And he had to think about it for a while. And then he came back to us and said, yeah, let's, let's go for it. So, uh, I was asked if I would like to do the figures for GI Joe, the new figure line. And I said, sure, because I, I love the military. I love the, I love uniforms. Uh, my dad was a Marine and everything. And I like history and, so it, it was kind of a perfect fit. And I was the only guy at Hasbro at the time that really worked on figures. And not, not that great at figure drawing, but I, I did my best, you know. And uh, yeah, I, I, I came out and I did uh, the whole first year of the G.I. Joe line. And uh, it went on from there, basically, uh, until about 1987. Ron, you were always wow. consistent in your humility. <laughs> um, it's, it's absolutely amazing. Like you built the process uh, for designing these figures basically from scratch. There wasn't templates for you to follow and you had to figure that out. You guys were working off a brand new buck, uh, which for those that don't know, is the skeleton that all the toys are built on. Um, yeah. So you, you developed the model. Oh, he's got one. <laughs> Uh, so, so Ron basically built the model that all the design figure designers after him got the privilege of following. That's part of a buck. Yep. The upper body right there. So wow. that's the, shul the shoulders, the, the neck body. and the torso. Um, I don't even know what this goes to. And that's a, but that's I'm a two up. <laughs> that's a two up, right? So that's twice yeah. the scale of what the actual, so that, that crotch it's piece is twice the scale. Yep. But you had the, you had those limitations that you were working with it all all the figures you designed had to fit on that same buck, right? So how did you, yeah. how did you manage we were, to do 125 figures on the same buck and keep it fresh? We were very limited. Uh, you know, uh, we get a buck and, you know, the sculptors have to sculpt down to whatever the size of the buck is. You can't, so that you can't do a lot of detail or anything like that. You know, and um, I want to detail. I love detail, but they wouldn't let me do it. So, um, yeah, so, you know, we we're very, very, very limited. Uh, engineering did a, a good job at that time coming up with that book. And I know I just had to create right, right around that, that book constantly. And yeah, sure. Well, I had a lot of ideas and I just went with it. When, when you started out, uh, did you know how many figures were going to be in the initial line? And uh, at what point did you, how many figures did you have on your desk once you got rolling? How many designs did you have going at any one time? That's hard to say. Um, any one time that, you know, it's a, uh, I think, I, I'm not sure, I'm not sure what we had the first year, maybe 12 figures. I don't, I don't remember. Mm -hmm. The carded but, uh, figures, uh, you rolled out the original nine Joes, and then later uh, came the two Cobras on the card. Yeah, and, and that's, the why, mail order. that's why I love you, Carson. That's why I love you, because you, you know the, the history more than I do. I'm kind oh, of obsessed. Oh, insane, isn't it? I'm kind of obsessed. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so the, the original nine green men, basically, the, the GI Joes, and then you got the, the Cobra and Cobra Officer. And then the flag points, the first promo was that mail order Cobra Commander, uh, which all those orders came in over Christmas of 1982. And uh, I heard uh, they had to create a metal cage to put all the envelopes with like 75 cents and flag points in because I think you guys had <laughs> tens of thousands of people send in for that Cobra Commander and it was a huge hit. Um, yeah. So, so Ron, I got to ask you, have you ever watched the cartoon? No. Not at all. I was kind of <laughs> hoping you were going to say that. No, only one. Yeah. Okay. I was, I was kind of hoping you were going to say that because I'm curious how it, how it Greater feels 
to, to see the guys that you created in animated form? No, the traitor Ruda is the only one they ever, we ever watched. The traitor with Dusty. The traitor. Dusty. Yep, yep with Dusty. Yeah. Dusty okay. Ruda. Yeah. Dusty's <laughs> last name is Tador, which is Rudat backwards. And then in the cartoon, don't they actually say Rudat once? Yeah. Instead of Tador? Yeah, they, they say yeah, Rudat. They so we should have, we'll have you back on for that episode if we make it this far in the series. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So, uh, right, so um, I've always been curious, and Carson, I'm sure you know this one off the top of your head, but let the man speak. Uh, I, I've, never under, I've never known the story behind the swivel arm battle grip and, and wh why such an innovation came one wave into the line. Was that something you were trying to do at launch and couldn't accomplish? Or was it something you figured out along the way? Are you asking me? Yes, sir. <laughs> I really don't know. <laughs> so I, I will say this for Ron, uh, that would have been the engineering guys. <laughs> that, that's that, the that, engineering guys. That's guy, the engineering yeah. guys. That wouldn't have been in his purview, right? Okay, okay. You know, that's something that marketing would have come up with, you know, and uh, and, and engineering. Uh, I had nothing to do with it. Okay. I'm having Fair flashbacks enough. of those uh, old Saturday Night Lives where Garrett Morris would show up in the background and start yelling. And, and I'm, I'm getting I'm getting that from Carson when we ask Ron a question. There's Carson right. in the background with, there were 12 figures in the first line. I'm here to help. <laughs> Well, yeah, I drove facts for the hard of hearing. That's why he's here. That's why he's here. Uh, <laughs> okay, right. should we get into the cartoon? I, yeah, I, I was basically a workhorse when I was at yep. uh, at Hasbro. I stayed at, I stayed in my office. I never socialized. I just continuously worked. You know, yep. so. Oh no, I, I think I anyone that's well, in any we're glad you did production. I, I think anyone that's in any kind of high production field. You know, it's just at some point it's just a pile of drawings, and you know it's it, it's it's easy to lose what drawing you did when. I, I work in animation, and and you know we're always juggling a lot of different stuff at the same time. So I get it. Well, we had schedules, and I met every damn schedule I, that was given to me on the figures. Yeah. You know? yeah. I mean, uh, you know, between costing and and. Uh, I don't know, doing sculptural input and a bunch of other things, uh, uh, color studies. Uh, and th there's a whole process to it. Sure. It takes forever. It takes forever. You know, so it's, um, but I always met up my schedule when they needed it. So, you know, it, you know, we were always working a year ahead anyway. Um, yeah. You know. Did you have a research team or was that all on you as well? That was all on me. Wow. I mean, I did all I did all my own research. I still do my own research. I have to look at. Yeah, I'm doing commission. I'm doing commissions for people mm -hmm. uh, of GI Joe figures. I still have to look them up to see what they look like, <laughs> and uh, look at weapons and stuff like that. You know, because I can't remember what they look like. There's so many of them. <laughs> Well, thousands of adoring fans remember every detail. There's, there's, there are many Carsons in the world. That's true. Uh, <laughs> ours that's is that's very what, special, and we like him best. That's, that's my bookcase. Wow. That's my bookcase over there. It's filled with military books and art books, and right now it's got Joe's in the front of them. You got some carded figures up there too. I, Ron, personally, I've loved watching you collect over the last several years in the Facebook groups. Yeah. Uh, it's a lot of fun for me to see someone that made this stuff you know, 35 years later, enjoying wow. just the process of collecting it. So that's a lot of fun. Was there a human face hanging off the side of that shelf? Did I see that's a that? Mask. It's a mask. <laughs> Is that, that's yeah. one of the G.I. Joe masks? <laughs> no, that's me. That's you from what? Uh, that's uh, for, uh, when I was working in the stop and shop over there at, at Hasbro. That's where R&D was at one time. Mm -hmm. And somebody did a uh, alginate mask of me. I laid down on a table wow. poured the stuff all over my face and that's made out of auto body buddy. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Wow. Well, so okay. Ron, we get to uh, all enjoy the act of watching your second GI Joe, a real American hero cartoon with you. Everybody on Facebook, throw some questions up for us for Ron. Uh Oh, <laughs> 
guy's good on volume. Yeah. You can actually, you can knock it down just a little bit. Yeah. Okay. So Ron, some of the so things Ron, we've been noticing are the uh, character changes that they've made. Like Snake Eyes has bare hands in this cartoon, and that's so you could see the action of what he's yeah. doing. Brandon, you're gonna say something? No, no. Okay. Yeah, well, er er everybody takes liberties. All, all, all your comic guys take liberties too. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Got to keep an eye on those comic guys. Yeah, Actually, only, only the artists. <laughs> I always tried to uh, stay as close to the actual toy design as I could. Uh, I think Zartan was the only one I got any pushback from Hasbro uh, because I, I used your your Zartan design, uh, but they didn't like the, the half shirt, and so they made me redraw him with a, a different kind of design. They didn't want the exposed midriff, the belly yeah. shirt. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Tom, I always thought Sargent was too sexy. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, okay, so Cobra is uh, currently trying to obtain three elements before the Joes do to get their mass device teleporter working. And now oh, this is happening. Now, as you're drawing this, and I'm sure you're probably, you know, thinking of what they sound like and, and how they speak when you see the, the the cartoon are they anywhere close to what was going on in your head i never really thought much about how they spoke or anything um, and it's funny because i'll go to a, a convention or something like that and i'll i'll meet some of the people that were in these cartoons and you know i have no idea what their voices have been like <laughs> It's interesting to me, Ron, like you created a name, usually a generic name uh, for these, like a uh, polar trooper for Snow Serpent, right? And then it was handed off to Larry Hama at Marvel Comics to create the actual like final code name and the code name of, you know, who that person was in real life, what their specialties were and that kind of thing. Um, and then it migrated from uh, comic books into cartoons as well. And a lot of liberties were taken. Uh, how does it... What's that feeling like that something you created has gone on and lived on in all these different mediums? Uh, well, I'll tell you, I'm really amazed. I, I, I'm more amazed about the Cobra logo than anything else because it's, <laughs> it, it's been out there. It's, it's on everything. You know, and, uh, you you know, just creating that thing, was, it, it was, it's amazing to me. And then I see some of the figures. Um, and uh, they're still around today after like 30 years, you know, even more than that. It just, it's incredible. Yeah, for those that and don't then, know, Ron did the Cobra sigil, the logo design uh, in 1982, and he's got the original hanging on his wall, which was thrilling. It is, it is to this day, it is my favorite it, piece of G.I. Joe iconography, hands down. Oh, it's the best I, logo. I'm not yeah. a, yeah, I'm not an artist, and I, I, I like to draw when I was a kid. I spent more time drawing, trying to draw that damn logo uh, than anything. I, than literally anything. I, I, I must hours and hours trying to draw the Cobra logo perfectly. I have a hard time drawing it. <laughs> yeah, it, it's... Uh... No, I, mean, I did it by hand, but not on a computer, because we didn't have computers back then on that stuff. Right. right. So it's, it's a lot harder doing it by hand. Ron, let's talk about Destro. <laughs> where did the where did the chrome helmet come from? Was that a uh, material that they recommended that you use, or how did that idea no. to do this chrome headpiece come about? And then, how do you think of Destro's helmet in your head? Is it stationary, or should it be moving like this? Should it have the black eyebrows that the cartoon has? Probably not. Probably Those weird not. eyebrows. What were your thoughts on Destro, or how did he come about? Well, I did. I just came up with an idea. That's all. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of those, a lot of those ideas came out of my head rather than looking up something or researching anything. It just mm -hmm. popped in my head to do that kind of thing for a bad guy. And uh, I just wanted him to look menacing and and 
Yeah, so you know, maybe it was made from the uh, the French movie there, the Man in the Iron Mask. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure, uh, could have been could have been from that, you know. But, and, so, uh, and so, once you have that idea that you're going to make this bad guy with a metal mask, would you have then gone and partnered with engineering to find out about the chroming process, or how might that have happened? I don't think we had the chroming back then. I mean, I think we had the silver, the silver paint, but I, as far as chroming, mm -hmm. that's later on. Yeah. Was there ever a character design that you just had to try and try again to get through? Was there ever a character that you just kept getting pushed back on and you were determined to, to bring to life? No, not really. Um, no, I just came up with the idea and I just went with it, you know. Um, I, I never really had a hard time with any one figure at all. You know, uh, when creating a figure, I would do six or seven different drawings of what that figure would be. And, uh, and then I'd show it to marketing and they could pick and choose what they wanted in, in that figure. Um, like they'll take the, the gun from one figure put it on another take the guns from another one put it on this guy you know they would move things around but i do about seven or eight different drawings so yeah those are those are pretty much all gone now the drawings are gone pretty much uh i had a lot a lot of stuff that i sold uh, uh quite a while ago mm -hmm. and uh, I kept every drawing and every sketch I ever did for Hasbro. I, did, I didn't throw anything away. I, I will say a lot of those, if, if any of you guys want to see a lot of that stuff in, in the flesh, in the, you know, in real life, uh, come to the conventions, come to a GI Joe, come to a Joe declassified booth at Joe Fest or whatever the big shows that they attend. There are Joe Declassified people in all parts of the country and they will set up at different conventions and they have these paper drawings that Ron did. They have paintings that Garrido did for crying out loud. It's amazing. They have two ups, the, the figure sculpts at twice the scale, hand painted prototypes. Um, so if you wanna see that kind of stuff, come to a convention, uh, meet the guys from Joe Declassified and you'll learn a lot and see a lot. Yeah, I got to I, see some of it at uh, Joe Fest last year. It was just fantastic. Yeah, that was a good time. I enjoyed that. It's heartbreaking to hear how much of that stuff got painted over. I mean, I understand, you know, it was production art, that kind of thing, but uh, yeah. it's, it's package painting. It's sad that, yes, it's sad that that some of that stuff is is gone. Well, luckily, Ron brought most of his stuff home, right? So at the end of the day, Ron would bring his sketches home. And so those have made it out into a lot of very grateful collector's collections. Um, sure. what, what Tom is referring to, Ron, is the packaging art, which was painted over when they would re-release oh. it with a different decoration, like Tiger Force. Yeah, yeah. They would just yeah. paint right over it. So yeah. Yeah, that's, a, that's a tragic <laughs> loss. Ron, well, do you want to talk about dumpster diving to save artwork? <laughs> Yeah, I did. I did a little bit of dumpster diving. Uh, well, even before I got on the Joe team, they were going to throw away a lot of the uh, twelve-inch uh, illustration package illustrations, and I, I uh, grabbed a, a few of those before I left. I also uh, used to go dumpster diving, look at sketches from other designers and what they have done. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I only kept a few of those things, uh, but they're, they're all gone now. Did you have the feeling, Ron, in the early 80s when you were working on this, that it was lightning in a bottle, that it was special, that it was going to be a, a highlight of your career? Or was it just another day at your creative day job? Just another day doing what I enjoy doing, that's all. I never thought about it blossoming the way it has, you know, over the years. So. Mm -hmm. That's amazing yeah, it, to me because it I, certainly has. I remember, I, I remember as a kid walking down a toy aisle and uh, just floor to ceiling seeing GI Joe packages, 
I'm sure at some point you had to walk through a, a, a store and see an aisle full of little boys freaking out over the, the latest line of toys. Not really. I didn't see any little wow. boys. I saw, I saw a lot of older boys. Really? Like like you guys uh, <laughs> looking at this stuff. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I remember going to Toys R Us with uh, Kurt and Ziggy, and then uh, we would look at packaging because we would do uh, uh, like a research trip uh, looking at all different various toy lines and and then we'd see G.I. Joe and everything that was there. And it was it was nice to see, you know. I, I wish uh, all the guys, the vehicle guys got to see all that stuff, but I don't know if they did or not. Yeah. It was uh, it was very strange to, to be a collector of G.I. Joe and like, you know, now in the modern age, there's so many you know, exclusive figures and, and you know, the, the rare chase variants and all these things. And I, it was it was a weird kind of happy torture to love something that was always available in such abundance, right? Like, I don't know how it was where you lived, guys, but like G.I. Joe was everywhere and in oh, yeah. plentiful amounts. And and if you bought five, there were five you left behind, right? Yep. And yep. and so I, I love that that constant drive was there because it was available. And I, I would rather have that, that pursuit than go chasing down some rare figure that's only for GameStop or whatever. And And usually marked up exorbitantly yeah, well sure <laughs> yeah we, we i think we were fortunate to grow up in the golden age of, of toys um mm, without a doubt it, it was you know you think about walking down those aisles of gi joe and star wars and masters of the universe and again like toys r us and stores like that still existed and it was just uh you know to borrow a phrase from retail pile it high and watch it fly and i'm sure you know there were millions and millions and millions of units of G.I. Joe sold every year. Well, we never even knew that it would even get that far. You know, that first year that Joe was out there, it was such a great big hit. Uh, now, none of us could really believe it, you know. and uh, Yeah. At what point did you know you had a, a hit? Like, what, what was the, the, the thing where you were like, oh, wow, I guess this is a thing now? Well, Kurt, uh, well, I knew because Kurt Bazikian would come in. He, you know, he's really good with all the guys. He would come back and talk with us and everything. And, mm -hmm. and uh, he would give us the latest news on, on uh, the product line, whether yeah. it's Joe, Joe or whatever. And uh, that, that's when we basically knew that it was a hit through him. After 1982, you know, 1982, you had to make some sacrifices. There weren't unique head sculpts with every figure, and you had a lot of the same uh, co a limited color palette, limited paint apps. You knew you had a hit on your hands by 83 because they gave you carte blanche, right? And just right. let you run wild with it. Do you want, do you want to talk about yeah. that kind of reaping the rewards of your hard work and how that felt? Oh, it felt good because uh, carte blanche, I could do anything I wanted to do, <laughs> you know? And uh, I basically did. So, but um, I mean, like I say, I, I love the military and I love the military aspect of it. And, and uh, on a lot of these jokes, you, you'll see a lot of uh, um, that military in a Joe somewhere, you know, whether it's a beret or a buckle or, or, or something uh, that came from that time. You know, Vietnam, you know, and uh, that's what I, I love that stuff. And, you know, that's why I have all these books up here to, for reference, you know, to look at different things, right. different, different periods of time. You know, I have books that, uh, uniform books that go back to, uh, I don't know, 14th century, you know, and, and uh, I would look at things like that and, and, uh, try to come up with some new designs or even the star Wars. Uh, I, I would look at that and look at a helmet or look at a body armor or something like that and, and, and create my own from there. But uh, that's funny because when GI Joe came out, I was a big star Wars fan and I dropped star Wars as soon as I got GI Joe. Uh, I just because so. the, I the think toys star Wars. were so much more exciting. I think Stars, Star Wars was slowing down. It, it it was on a real good climb for a while, and then I think it started slowing down. Then Joe came out, 
and then uh, I th and then there if were I more. If I remember correctly, if I remember correctly, GI Joe came out, and then Return of the Jedi hit. And yeah. yep. as a kid, I, the choice was between Return of the Jedi toys or GI Joe. And I think Amen. I only bought a handful of, of Jedi figures. Everything after that was G.I. Joe or Transformers, uh, yeah. leaning heavily on G.I. Joe. Now, I was going to ask you, as far as design goes, um, I know the military was supportive. Uh, did you have people from Defense Department, not necessarily Defense Department, but different weapon suppliers, vehicle suppliers for the military petitioning you to say, hey, why don't you use this? piece of body armor or this uh jet design in your gi joe no armor. no no really? not really uh hmm. we did our own research like i was saying and we went to the natick army labs and hmm. down in uh, i think it's down in newton or newton highlands mass and we saw all the latest uniforms that were coming out the new the helmet that the military wears now we saw it there before the military saw it uh, you know, I mean, wow, they, they were a great help, you know, and then um, we do a research trip. We'd go to Otis Air Force Base down Cape Cod, and uh, there's a, also an Army base there, and we look at all the vehicles that they had out in their yard. I We would took a ride in an APC, you know, I sat mm -hmm. in a tank, you know, a bridge layer, all that kind of stuff. So we did our research. Uh, yeah, that's fantastic. I'm, I, I'm sorry, I'm just starting to put this together. Uh, you mentioned uh, at the top of the show that your, your father was a Marine. Right. Uh, is, is the gung-ho dress figure, is that a tribute to your, to your father or your father's service or just the, Mar you know? Um, there's like three Marines in there. And uh, yeah, they're all, they're all a tribute to my dad. Uh, that's fantastic. I, well, Leatherneck has my face on the package, the original yes. package. Mm -hmm. So that that's I'm known as Leatherneck. Not nobody knows me as Dusty, <laughs> but <laughs> it's Leatherneck. <laughs> and then the gung ho, and uh, and then there's uh, the dress marine. Okay. I wanted the I wanted the the uh, longer blouse on the marine, but we couldn't do it. You know, oh, so sure. we made we made the Ike jacket kind of a blouse. So. Yeah, I love that uh, you fought for that figure. I, I heard the story of how somebody in the meeting didn't like it because they didn't think there would be enough play value in a dress blues kind of figure. And pretty and much, yeah. You pushed and pushed and got that one done. So yeah, I love that story. Yeah, right. what pisses right. me off is that the the uh, presentation art. I don't know how Greg Bernson got a hold of it, but he ended up with it. I wanted it. And then he sold it to somebody. <laughs> so, uh, oh, oh man! That should that, come home. That, that's uh, a beautiful pizza. It's a beautiful piece of art by uh, oh, what's his name? George Woodbridge. Yeah, George Woodbridge, and George Woodbridge did a whole series of uniform drawings on the American Civil War. Yeah, of which I I've got all three of his books. You know, so I I just love his work. Yeah, I think uh, those of us collectors that, that uh, uh, loved and appreciated the gung-ho dress blues were only sad that we didn't get any of the other branches in, in their kind of dress attire. So, yeah, uh, me too. I always lamented not getting one of each. Yep. All right, well, let's tune back into the cartoon and get, get back to yeah. And Ron, please uh, have a look at this cartoon. Tell us your thoughts on it. Do you think it's good? Do you think it's bad? Do you enjoy <laughs> it? Like, how do you feel when you watch this? <laughs> <laughs> I only went to Sunbow one time. <laughs> uh huh. Tell us about it. Oh, there wasn't much to tell. I, just, I don't even remember much. It was basically a meeting, that's all. Was this in LA or New York? Uh, LA. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you meet uh, Russ Heath while you were there? Who? Russ Heath was the character designer on the show. No. No, okay. I, I don't remember. All the festivities. Were you a fan of comic books, stuff like that, when you were younger? A what? Were you a comic book fan when you were younger? 
I'm just curious about what, what got you into art. You know, a little bit, but not, I wasn't big time into comic books. I like Sergeant Rock. I like all uh, GI combat, you know, mm -hmm. the military, World War II comics. Sure. I basically like, like. Guys like Joe Kubert. Yeah. Yep. Actually, I got one of them here somewhere. <laughs> Is there a toy did some amazing work? I don't see why not. Is, is there a toy of any kind that that you uh, wish you had designed? So proud of me for this, Scarlet. I wish I designed. Oh man. Yeah. Or or that you just are a great admirer of that you had nothing to do with. I can't think of anything really. When I was growing up, I had very very few toys. Uh No. You mentioned. Oh, I'm sorry. I had very few toys growing up, uh, so I really I can't tell you. One of the questions you, that uh, came from the Facebook from Eric Fernandez was, "Hey Ron, did you ever get to keep any of the toys from Hasbro when you worked there? Did they comp you? Did they just give you free copies? I know that happens a lot in comics. You guys, Tom and Brandon, get free <laughs> books, right? But Ron, did you get any free toys?" <laughs> Yeah, the five finger kind. Uh, the five finger kind. <laughs> five finger discount. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I I got a I got a few of those here. Uh huh. I still have my original uh, Sky Striker in the box. Nice. Ooh. Nice. Uh, I got a few other ones in the in the back room, and I got some a bunch of twelve inch figures. Mm -hmm. uh, when I started collecting my. G.I. Joe figures again, the Sky Striker was the first thing I got. It, it, it's kind of an amazing thing that I, I just don't know that they could do that toy today yeah. for less than a hundred bucks at least. Well, and they yeah. tried in the new Sky Striker, like the bottom tail win wings had to break off from like the drop test or whatever. And it's a much more like fragile, flimsy feeling version of yeah. it. I, I much prefer 1983 Sky Striker. Yeah. For those of you who have been following uh, the the commentary on the show, I do want to point out that we, we, uh, there was a key moment. Duke was once again captured uh, <laughs> by a tank of water. Uh, I assume it snuck up on him. Uh, he probably didn't see it coming. Uh, Duke's Duke's ability in this show is to get captured. We have determined uh, that is his number one skill. So Ron, in this cartoon, look at Cover Girl right there. She's got blonde, long hair, and uh, the action figure, of course, has the short brown hair. Um, did you do you remember? And I know this was like 1982 or 83 when you were drawing her. Do you remember when you pitched Cover Girl originally? Were you ever thinking long hair? I mean, the first long-haired woman we got was Baroness, and she had the plastic piece for hair. Yeah, but no, I was, I was thinking of long hair, especially with the name Cover Girl. No. Yeah, you would think. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> long hair, blonde. Oh, the challenges hair. of hair. Yeah. Well, I'm sure it had to do with her looking so similar to Scarlet. Mm -hmm. Well, I, Scarlet had. Scarlett had to have red hair because I love red hair on a girl. Yeah. <laughs> you you and I would get along well, Ron. I, I, I married a redhead. Yeah, I've you're lucky. I've always been a sucker for the red-haired girl. Yeah. Me and Charlie I Brown. divorced one, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the design of the weapons... Um, the, the, the gun that Snowjob used, it, it, we see it used all over the place on this show, but it doesn't look like anything um, in terms of real weapons. W was that something laser you were rifle. looking at? Yeah, the laser rifle. Is that something that came from looking at Star Wars, things like that? Because it really, it doesn't look like anything from Star Wars really either. No. No, actually, I, I made up a lot of those things. No, I mean I would look at actual weapons, but I we never. I don't think we really copied the actual weapon all the way. You know what I mean? And uh, yeah, I would I would change them around. I was surprised. I tried to do a custom of uh, Rock and Roll's machine gun, 
and uh, it escapes me right now, but if I remember correctly, his machine gun was made up of a German machine gun and then a, a completely different machine gun. Like the front end was one gun and the back end was a completely different gun. Yeah. No. Um, well, Gung Ho, Gung Ho has got a 50 caliber, so you know that was that was probably the closest to a real weapon. And then there's an M16 out there too, but yeah, uh, yeah. And then uh, Roadblock had the Modus. Yeah. But a lot of them, no, a lot of them I made up. Ron, there's your snake eyes in blue with purple accents and no gloves yeah. on. Yeah, like, Ron, uh, Ron uh, for those folks that haven't heard the story, do you want to talk quickly about why Snake Eyes was all black? How that ended up happening? Well, the reason he's black is uh, because I used to watch uh, ninja movies on TV when I was a kid. Yes. And, of course, the ninja guys were always the bad guys, but what I wanted to do... I wanted to do an opposite of uh, of a bad guy and make him black good guy. Yeah. And, I, and, and then I made the good guy or the bad guy white. So. Storm yeah, Shadow, 1984. Yep. Yeah. I just wanted to reverse it. Right. You know. Where did the decision come from to um, redesign Snake Eyes for, uh, was it 85? Yeah, with Timber. Yep. Yeah. Ron, do you remember, uh, you know, so the 1985 Snake Eyes was primarily black too, but he had some silver touches on him and he had the big visor and he came with the Timber Wolf, which came from the cartoon. Do you remember the process of redesigning Snake Eyes and how you arrived at those design decisions? Uh, I really, I, I don't remember, but I, I just remembered um the visor that he wears over his eyes is basically uh from a character that was in star trek mm. um oh jordy jordy laforge the one that drives the uh you know enterprise enterprise yeah yeah <laughs> he drives basically drives enterprise and he wears those things over his eyes there and that's basically uh, where I came up with the idea for Snake Eyes. Later, sister, we've got Interesting. Yeah. I was going to bring flowers. But, I, <laughs> but I yeah. Like these no, I just always wanted to have him black and then, and then uh, uh, some really stealthy type outfit, you know. Oh, it's got some powerful arrows in this cartoon, man. <laughs> <laughs> Just blew up a hiss tank. You know how arrows. arrows work. I can't watch. I can't watch a cartoon today. No. What is it about? No. I, I don't know. It's just like they. I don't know. Not enough action there or something. I don't know. I feel the same way when I read comic books now. Kidding, guys. <laughs> I expected more of a rise out of Tom and Brandon mm. on that one. Yeah. I'm sorry, did you, you say something? You can't hurt me. I'm a writer. Right. <laughs> I've already hurt myself. Yeah. <laughs> the, the walls are up and they're solid. Uh-oh, they've lost. You know, it's funny to me. I went to a convention uh, last year in Cincinnati, and I had two uh, G.I. Joe, uh, uh, what do you call it, voice actors near me. Uh-huh. And the G.I. Joe guys would keep going over to them and everything else and, and getting autographs and getting pictures and all that kind of stuff. I'm standing, I'm sitting right next to those people and not one of them came over to me. Oh, wow. so it's like, you know, um, they're more into the voice actors than anything else. I you must have just not known who you were. And what you so did. That's part of why I stopped going to conventions is that more and more you would see people lining up for autographs from uh, cosplayers or mm -hmm. guys yeah. who show up just they, they sell they have like a wall of prints, but they've never actually worked for a publisher or a proper client. Uh, but to the casual fan, they don't know that. They think that they're buying something that's been licensed or from a professional mm -hmm. artist in some way, but they're really not. And um, 
it's just it, it just got kind of depressing after a while that uh, you know, the people who are actually creating the things that people love are kind of getting shoved aside for uh, you know I don't know, and it's not to put down cosplayers because there are cosplayers who do some amazing work and uh, really go a long way to create uh, impressive molds and sculpts and really, you know, fantastic stuff. And I know people who have transitioned from fans to professional costumers on film and television. Yeah. Well, what's funny that in Cincinnati too. Uh, uh, the woman who played Scarlet in the, in the cartoons, I met her, mm -hmm. and then the, uh, the sailor, I can't think of his name right now. Shipwreck. Shipwreck. And, and we were all in a, uh, oh, what do you call, um, where we get up on stage and we talk to the people. Oh, you were on a panel. You were on a panel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were on a panel. Yeah. There's three of us. And I started talking and telling them about Scarlet and and uh, shipwreck, and uh, they look over to me and say, "You did that?" <laughs> it, was, it was funny. It was just funny to me. You're in the yeah. one, huh? <laughs> yeah, it's funny. Did you get that? Uh, uh, did you get that big banner that's printed big. up for you for yourself, Ron? That you drape over the table to show all the characters that you designed and everything. Yeah, but I think I'm going to have to get another one because it doesn't fit the table quite that oh, good. Okay. Well, I think that would go a long way to just kind of cluing people in to this guy made all this stuff, you know. I have to get a bigger one uh, that fits over the entire table. Right. Right. Or do, so do you have a standing like a, a, huh? do you have a standing banner? I finally got one this year. Last year. Yeah. That helps a lot, I found. Guys, yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to grab something to show before we jump off. So if you guys want to ask okay. him any of the questions that came through the Facebook uh, or any other uh, questions yeah, that you yeah. have. Tom, you talk. I'll look at questions on Facebook. I'm just terrified of what he's going to come back with. <laughs> uh -uh. <laughs> I was going to say, I, I'm curious to learn a little bit more about your, your background as an artist. Um, you know, were you a kid who drew all the time? Was it something you came to later? Um, you know, was it, were you the kid who in class was drawing instead of paying attention to the teacher? You know, what, what were you like as a kid and what got you into making the leap to a professional artist? Yeah. Um, when I was a kid, you know, um, my parents argued a lot. Mm -hmm. And so my, my dad had built me a room and it was up in the attic and, uh, I would I'd go up there and I'd probably sit there at night and draw. They'd have to tell me to turn off the lights and everything, but I wouldn't, and I would just keep drawing. And I'd be doing hot rods and, and girls and stuff like that. Yeah. And then in high school, um, I took graphic arts in high school. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a basically a trade school. And then sure. from there... I went to Boston and I went to an art school there in Boston for about three years. Mm -hmm. And uh, from Boston, I got hired by Hasbro when I graduated. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I started working for Hasbro in the art department, like I said before, and worked on all kinds of different things. I did weebles wobble that don't fall down. You know, I did artwork for that. Yeah. Uh, Hungry Hippos, I did work for that. Uh, a lot of instructional stuff. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I also like fine arts as well. And uh, when I got uh, let go from Hasbro in 99, I started painting. And I, I did that for about five years. Mm -hmm. And try to get into some galleries. I got in a couple of galleries, but uh, didn't do too well there. And then uh, I started doing commissions for people. And mm -hmm. uh, that seemed to work. I was doing freelance at, at the same time. Um, sure. Mostly, mostly giftware. And, uh, mm -hmm. and nothing, nothing to do with toys because I couldn't get a job in, uh, with toys. I, well, I did Spin Master. I did a little bit for them. Um, mm -hmm. Another company in New York I did some work for. 
So, uh, yeah, I, I'll give you a brief look at my, my studio, okay? Nice, thanks, sure. and, and, I mean, there's my bookcase, and then coming around, there's more over there, and then it's, it's all piled up. There's all my paintings on, on the sofa. Yep. Mm -hmm. Wow. And then I have artwork over there. Got your flat files yeah. in the corner. <laughs> yeah. Got your paintings. Yeah. More artwork. Oh, it's beautiful. Oh, that's Civil beautiful. War. Wow. Mm -hmm. Civil War, right? Yeah. Uh huh. For those that don't know, Ron is a uh, or was a Civil War reenactor and would get up yeah. in the full, the full garb. And you actually dressed up like you fought for the South, didn't you? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, I was a 34th Virginia cavalry dismounted. Look at all those swords yeah. up there. Oh, I know. It's awesome. Coming to visit you several years ago and hanging out in your studio with you and going through your boxes and boxes of drawings. Um, God, man, that was like one of my single favorite fanboy moments. I've had so many collectors come up here. I've, I've had a ton of collectors come to my house and I don't want to go looking for stuff, so I let them go looking for it. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about a kid in a candy store. Yeah. It's amazing. My, my studio is a mess because of them, because they don't put anything back. Well, to be fair, how do they know where it goes? <laughs> well, they so pulled Ron, it out from somewhere. I know you wouldn't, uh, I know you wouldn't promote uh, yourself too much or too heavily here, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to promote for you. If you guys ever get a chance to see Ron at any of these conventions, contact him beforehand. He will put together commissions for you, and you can pick him up, shake his hand, get his signature. Uh, this is a snow serpent that he did for me uh, before the <gasps> second – before the second to last wow. Joe Con, let me just get in close on that. Uh, so Ron did the original figure design for this figure, but this is a modern drawing that Ron made for me of Snow Serpent. And then you know, you guys know I'm a little obsessed with Falcon, so I got him to Great, uh, googly also, googly. also do Lieutenant Falcon. Um, and these are very fairly, <coughs> very fairly priced. Uh, and to have a piece of memorabilia from the man who designed the figures themselves is priceless. So I reach out to I Ron. I won't do anything after 87. That's right, because okay. you, you didn't personally you didn't personally design those figures, so that makes a lot of sense. You you want to draw the stuff yeah. that you were responsible for. So, oh no, you it, only have it, those it, dozens and dozens of great things to draw from. Yeah, oh, like a no. hundred. You only have a hundred <laughs> plus figure designs to tap into. Um, oh. Something else I'll show for you, Ron, and maybe you could comment on this. These are the uh, original Cobra and Cobra Officer drawings. Yep. Wow. Back in the day. Uh, and, yeah. and you have the little notations out to the side. Like, I love this part, the piano wire on the shoulder there. So you could uh, choke people out right there. <laughs> so that says piano wire for those that were wondering. <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. That, was, that was not like a little, uh, you know, like tr trophy little like ribbon or something. That's something that yeah. choke people out with. Interesting. So. Okay. Yeah. I, no, note to self, Brandon Jerwa, you are, you're going to get one of these commissions uh, next time there's a joke on. I, I thank you, Carson. That's a hot tip and I will take it. Uh, folks, we, we can't tell you how much of an honor it has been tonight to, to have the great, the great Ron Rudat with us. I, this is so exciting. Thank you so much, Ron, for doing this. I can't, I can't tell you what it means to us. And I, I just mean that as sincerely as I can. Yeah, it, it's surreal to get to talk to you. Uh, it, it, you know, it was, <laughs> was I, I can't believe this is going on. <laughs> yeah. We just started our uh, little show on Monday, Ron, so that to have Larry Houston last night and have you tonight, um, yeah. it's, it's just an honor to hang out with you. You're always so engaging with yeah. the community. Yeah. You always are so giving of your time. Ron, thank you so much uh, for your time. Well, very welcome. And uh, stay I'm safe. I'm looking forward to seeing you at uh, Joe Fest. Yeah, yeah you bet. You have yeah. other, do you have any other shows on the books other than Joe Fest, Ron, that people can look out for you? Uh, with the Dark Nation, where is in Ohio. Okay. I was, I'm supposed to go to that, but I haven't heard a word from them. Okay. And then Joe Fest. Uh, and then I was supposed to go to Missouri uh, this past week, uh, April April 28th. Yeah, the Rob one. Rob Ross one, and uh, no. unfortunately, I can't. You know, he Understand. called it off from there. It's better to be safe than sorry at this moment. And you know, just as soon as the storm clears, I'll, I'll be up there to see you guys. And I'm really looking forward to that project. And we'll talk about yeah. that more when it gets a little closer. 
All right. I think we'll, uh, we'll sign off for tonight. We don't That's have it. immediate future plans for next week, but we do know that we're still going to continue the series. We love doing this, especially we can have, when we can have folks like Ron and Larry on. Um, so we're going to keep it coming. It'll probably only be once or twice a week. Uh, Tom Feaster is the CEO head in charge here. Tom, do you want to give any kind of uh, sneak peeks of what's coming? Not to put you on the spot. Uh, we, we've got uh, a few more guests in the pipeline. Uh, one I'm really excited about, and uh, we're hoping to put together kind of a special event for that. And uh, beyond that, just, you know, thank you. Stay tuned. Uh, I really, uh, I, I, I don't know about the rest of you, but this has been a balm at the end of some very long days this past week. Uh, Carson, I know you've been putting in a ton of work to put this together, and we really appreciate it. Um, but you know, I think for a lot of us, this has probably been the high point of our day on some tough days. Absolutely. So thank you, everyone, oh, for absolutely. watching. Thank you for taking part in this. I uh, really appreciate it. Ron, yeah, thank and you again for your time. And thank you for you know everything you've done that has affected our life. I mean, it's just a, a, a towering achievement. You made yeah. all of our childhoods better. Very much so. It's amazing. I, and also, I, I don't and I should point out Larry is in the Larry Houston is actually in the room again tonight. Nice. Yeah, and Welcome by the way, back, by Larry. the way, we failed to mention we failed to mention it, but thanks to Diana Davis for for helping us with Larry. Yes, Diana uh, Davis. That was huge, man. Thank you, Diana. Yeah. Seriously. Huge. Um huge, and, and if you want if there's any voice it. actors that are interested in watching it with us knuckleheads, we would love to have them. Uh, so we'll we'll keep this ball rolling. And again, the goal is just have fun, enjoy these cartoons, meet some of our you know, idols that made our childhood so entertaining. So thank you all for tuning in. And most of all, thank you, Ron, for taking the time. I hope to see you soon. Okay, take care, guys. He never gives up. He's always there, fighting for freedom over land and air. G.I. Joe, American hero. G.I. Joe is there.